This year's startup of the year is Lessonly. In a normal year, Indiana's tech community produces newsworthy venture capital investments, expansions, and acquisitions. But 2021 has taken that trend to an extreme, with several sizable acquisitions and nearly $1 billion invested in Indiana tech companies. In this interview series we are calling The Circuit, TechPoint serves up the human stories behind the major tech headlines in Indiana. I am your host, Mike Langelier, CEO of TechPoint. And today we talk to Max Yoder, CEO and co-founder of Lessonly. Founded in 2012, Lessonly grew to almost 300 employees and was recently acquired by Seismic. Lessonly provides software for training, enablement, and coaching of frontline teams and has long been a darling in Indiana's startup community. Max and Lessonly have been on a mission to help teams do better work. And in this episode, Max recounts Lessonly's origins and the people who made a difference along the way, shares about the winning company culture they've built, and opens up about how the acquisition happened. Max, thanks for having us into the office. You bet. Good to be here. It's a really, really cool space here on the northeast side of downtown. Yeah, right? yeah, just off the Monon, 16th. Yeah. And I just learned the history of this this building. Yeah. What did it? What did it used to be? Yeah, not not long ago, stored all of our, uh, all of IPS's musical instruments when they were in kind of repair state. Uh-huh. Like if we needed to get pianos tuned. Uh, so when we first walked up here and toured the place. There was a security, uh, IPS security on the first floor, kind of like centralized, and then rows and rows of cellos up here, rows and rows of violins, uh, and, uh, and pianos, so that was a very special thing. A lot darker than it is now. We, we opened the place up a bit light-wise. That had to be pretty cool for you with your musical background, musical interest as well? Yeah, it drew me to the place, and they let us keep a few pianos, and we have one right at the end of the hallway, and it is a very beautiful grand piano that we get tuned about every six months, and... I like playing it. I come in on the weekends to play it. Love it. Yeah. Well, hey, I know that you've had a big announcement here recently in an acquisition that we'll get into here in a little bit. And congratulations, Thanks. by the way. Thank you. Thank you for all your help. That's a big, big milestone. And it yes. takes a lot of years to get to what seems like a very uh, overnight success for, the, for many from the outside. Sure. Well, hey, we walked together uh, in the earliest of early days, uh, lessonly wise. So thank you very much for being here days. then and now. Well, that means a lot. That yeah, means thank a lot. You. It's been really cool to see your arc and the company's arc over that time. We're going to have a myriad of people that are, that are watching this mm-hmm. and wondering about the story of Lesson Lee, maybe heard the company, but know varying amounts about the company. Why yeah. don't you just first in a thumbnail share what TechPoint or, or what, what a Lesson Lee is yeah. and uh, what customers you serve? Yeah, Lessonly makes training software and coaching software. So really what we help companies do is build lessons, Mm -hmm. step-by-step lessons people can take on their phones, on their computers, and then practice scenarios. So practice scenarios are like, hey, I've just learned something. Now I'm going to try to do it. Mm -hmm. So I might turn on my webcam and practice what I've just learned. I might uh, just do something uh, via via chat. I might type out something. Uh, Basically building the muscle after I've learned something. So we do this this, uh, training and coaching for sales teams and customer service teams. Which is a little different because a lot of times you think training software, you might think yeah. sell the human resources mm-hmm. and it's going to do compliance. And while we uh, have sold the human resources and have done compliance, 80 plus percent of our business sales and customer service teams. So it's like okay. fundamentally, how do you do your job well in the customer service world or sales yeah. world? Let's put that all into Lessonly. We think a lot more people swim than sink when they're kind of guided. Yeah. And a lot of companies don't do a lot of guidance, right? That is true. It's very sink or swim. Yeah. So we're like, hey, if you want people to swim, yeah. show them the way, you know? Uh, it, and it works. I did a little um, uh, trip down memory lane uh, in the lead up to this interview yeah. and went back to 2015 yeah. when Lesson Lee won a Mira Award. Oh, yes, I remember. You were up on stage and you were, you were, you were uh, describing 2014 and the growth. And I think it was from like five to 15 employees yes. at I the time. I think I was giving so you a hand signal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So a uh, little bit has changed since then. Yes. The growth has been... Uh, quite a bit more significant. Yeah, we when we uh, sold the business to Seismic and joined that debt team, we were about 260, 270 full time. Um, so yeah, it was a wild uh, nine years. Yeah, you know, from inception to to selling the business, it's actually really impossible for me to think about how many people we had to hire. 
yeah. uh, to get there and just how that all got done, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the teams or the primary roles that you have across the team now? Yeah, uh, sales, customer service. Um, is, is, that, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, marketing, sales, customer service. So think pre-sales, post-sales. Um, think, you know, uh, G&A, when we think of that as like, you know, our legal, we have like a mm -hmm. full-time legal team, which mm -hmm. is like, never thought that would happen. Um, you know, finance, uh, talent, recruiting, all that good stuff. Yep. I'm missing plenty. In uh, addition to your product? Yeah, product, product there we go. Well. That's an important one. Yeah, yeah product and engineering, yeah. services, I mean, uh, solutions and consulting. It really was cool to go from a lot of people doing a lot of things to, you know, this specialization. It took a long time to get, yeah. for me to get used to that of like, highly specialized roles as opposed to kind of generalists. So you reference Seismic. Yeah. Major milestone of going through an acquisition process. To many, it's this kind of mystical, mysterious process. Yeah. Uh, but, but when you've lived through it, it's oftentimes crazy how just how serendipitous it is. Yes. Talk about the, what was the story? How did this all, all happen in your scenario? Yeah, 2018, Connor Burt and I are, um, and Connor Burt, the president of Lesson, they helped me start the business. Um, we're on the phone with Doug Winter, the CEO of Seismic. And we're like, we really like this guy. And there seemed, at that point, uh, another company uh, that was a competitor of Seismics had bought training software, had acquired mm -hmm. a training software company. So mm -hmm. we were like, hey, this might be a trend. It's only happened once, but mm -hmm. it might be a trend. It turned out to be a trend. It happened again and again and again. The market kind of pushed it that way. Okay. So we're talking to Doug in 2018 saying, if you ever make a move like that, you know, we would love to be considered. Mm -hmm. But we just would like to be a great partner of mm -hmm. yours. Um, you know, and we weren't too forward, like, you know, biased today, you yeah. know, but like, hey, let's build a business, let's build businesses together, make sure we know one another. So if it ever comes to, to, to the time where one of us wants to make a move here, yeah. we're already well established. That worked out really well. 2019, we started formalizing our go-to-market go to kind of sales process together. Mm -hmm. So we knew one another in that way. We had sold deals together, uh, uh, had an integration already. Mm -hmm. And so when it came down to them to say, like, hey, we do want to do this, you know, the competitive landscape's changing. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to have both training and what Seismic does, which is uh, really content. Mm -hmm. um, we want to have them both. They l looked at all their, their partners and said, like, who do we work best with? They talked to every one of them, right? But ultimately, they heard really positive feedback from their product org of like, we really like working with Lessonly, and the sales mm -hmm. orgs that we really like working with Lessonly. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I think, was a huge, huge benefit, yeah. you know, of like, I don't know how these deals ever get done. Having seen one get done, mm -hmm. like, like you said, has to have so many, so many things fall into place at mm -hmm. the right time. But I think the fact that they could trust that we could work well together out of the gate made a big difference. So uh, why Seismic for you? Yeah. You're... Your, your baby, you and Connor's baby, and the whole team that yeah. brought it to this point, yeah. and then you had to make a decision about who's, who's the right partner for the business. Why Seismic? Yeah, the, the, I mean, it was, to me, there's no other path uh, than, than joining forces with that company. Like, it was, mm -hmm. it was, to me, like, this is where the market is heading. We saw the sales teams and customer service teams, um, and we are seeing everybody else who does what we do, uh, either creating their own content offering or joining forces with somebody who has one. Mm -hmm. And for us, it was like, we only have domain expertise in what we do, right? Training and coaching. We do not have domain expertise in what Seismic does. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to pretend like I do, right? I'm not going to go raise a bunch of money, act like I can just build anything because we yeah. built one thing, you yeah. know? Um, and Seismic's really good, you know? So we were like, hey, this makes a ton of sense. And they had the, they had the urgency, right? Like, we weren't going to come to them and be like, we have to do this. They had to want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so the timing was right. I just felt like the motion of the ocean was going that direction, you know? It was impossible for me to look at them and say, like, this does not make sense. Yeah, that's awesome. When you, you've also talked about what you envision will be the impact on the community, yeah. company, yeah. tech community here. Yeah. S speak some more about that. What do you think the potential is? Well, my hope is um, that all the folks who got to work at Lesson Lee uh, learned uh, that they enjoyed certain ways of working. This, this is my, like, you know, my heart's hope, that yeah. they were like, I really liked how we did certain things at Lesson Lee. And maybe they didn't see them at other places, maybe they did, but either way, I hope they were inspired by yeah. certain ways that we uh, approached work. Mm -hmm. And all those people are gonna go work somewhere else, right? They're gonna start their own businesses, mm -hmm. uh, or they're going to be early employees at new businesses, or they're gonna you know, join other companies. And I, I hope they bring some of whatever that it was that we had here, there, mm -hmm. um, whether they're managing you know, a team or leading a company, whatever it is. Yeah. I think that is where the biggest ripple impact is gonna be, it's just people's it doesn't have to be scary at work is, is what was a big message of ours. Mm -hmm. Like people don't have to be scared at work. They're going to bring scary, they're going to bring their own fear to work, yeah. right? Because we want to do well, right? Yeah. We all kind of push ourselves, want to do well. Yeah. But top down pressure doesn't have to be the way yeah. of, you know, the CEO putting pressure on the other executive team who yeah. puts pressure down. Yeah. It's just not, what we wanted to operate at was, hey, Mike, uh, we believe in you. 
let us know how we can be helpful, mm -hmm. you're gonna put the pressure on yourself. And that's the best kind of pressure, right? It's coming from you, not from yeah. me, right? You're so just wanting to win. Let's talk more about that. We talked about that in the lead up you know, yeah. to this discussion as well, sort of this philosophical difference that when you think about the traditional role of a business, yeah. uh, it feels different. It can feel different to many. Yeah. And, and there are some that are going to be, that, that, that could hear that and say, that sounds like marketing fluffiness, uh -huh. right? So two questions. First, uh, how have you found to make that tangible? Yep. How have you, have you taken that ideology and then actually made it tangible in the workplace? Yeah, we, uh, so I got to, my teammates gave me space to write a book called Do Better Work. Mm -hmm. And that was really an encapsulation of what are the values that when we're doing them here, things just accelerate. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when we're not doing those same things, things slow down. Mm -hmm. And it became pretty evident that like these are just core ra relationship behaviors. Like as I'm writing the book, as I'm sp scanning the room, talking to people, it's like these are just healthy relationship behaviors. Yeah. So an example being having difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if people in a relationship avoid difficult conversations or argue, as, you know, so avoidance and argument kind of being yeah. the two extremes, instead of having a difficult conversation that is a conversation, right? Argument I do not consider a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of trying to win, yeah. you know, both people kind of yeah. trying to win. Um, if we can have difficult conversations, we can have healthy relationships, right? But that is not common. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's avoidance or it's argument. So mm -hmm. it's like, let's figure out a way methodically to have those difficult conversations. So that's the chap chapter seven yep. in the book, have difficult conversations, a method for doing so. Um, we have to also highlight what's working. So go to the other side of things, what's going well. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we got these things documented and we gave them uh, words. So people knew what highlight what's working meant. They know mm -hmm. what have difficult, have difficult conversations means. They know what share before you're ready means. These are all chapters in the book. Yep. And we gave 10 to 15 minute you know, overviews on all of them in the book. So if you're joining the company, you know what you're getting into. Did and you the, build it into the software? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You can, I mean, all the less, all the chapters are in the yeah. software, right? We, and our, and our customers use them, which That's is so cool. cool. Um, big idea here is these things build clarity, they build camaraderie, okay? Mm -hmm. But they're, they're not the easy thing to do. The easy thing to do is avoid having a difficult conversation. The easy mm -hmm. thing to do is not share something that's working, right? Mm -hmm. They're simple, but they're hard. Mm -hmm. So we were like, let's identify the simple and hard stuff that brings people together, and let's not only put them on the wall, but you know, give them words, uh, and let's make them real by living them, right? Yeah. The executive team has to live them, you get the idea. So flip it to one of the other, the second part of the question is accountability. You yeah. know, that comes up as well, so how do you, this kind of soft, supportive type of culture, yeah. then how do you, you know, in, in your case, when you're a venture-backed organization or one with ambitious goals, how have you found that you've been able to live that culture while also delivering the results with accountability you need? Yeah, I mean, I think about a marriage, which a marriage is a loving place that has a mm -hmm. tremendous amount of accountability built into it, right? Mm -hmm. Love and accountability go hand in hand. I think uh, a pseudo version of love, what people might call love that isn't love, is kind of this fluffy thing where we don't hold one another accountable. That's mm -hmm. not love to me. You know, love to me is, look, is my wife looking me in the eye and saying I'm frustrated and we need to talk about it. Because mm -hmm. I love you, yeah. right? Uh, <laughs> and I want to I wanna get, I wanna talk about it, right? I don't want to avoid that. Um, so accountability and, and like a supportive, loving environment to me, are they're one thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, when somebody is, when I'm frustrated with somebody, it is my job to sit down with them and say I'm frustrated. Yeah. They might not agree yeah. with my frustration, right? And that's a teammate, that's my wife, that's anybody you have a real relationship with, right? That's, I'm, that's, that's how I prove to you that I value the relationship, is yeah. I, I sit down and do the difficult stuff. So accountability, I think, is hand in hand. And we have metrics that we measure, right? We have operational metrics that we measure. We have relational things we care about. Mm -hmm. And the blend of the two is where it becomes a really cool uh, yin-yang, right? Can't just be relational, where we don't think about the operations, and it can't just be operations where we don't think about the relationship. Yeah. Totally makes sense. Very cool. You tip. You kind of tip open the door to the personal side. Let's go there. You're, you've. You've. We've talked about your your baby of Lessonly. Yeah. Yeah. And now handing that off. But you fairly recently brought a new baby into the world. Yeah. In a very literal sense. Yes. How, how has that experience of becoming a father influenced your worldview or even le your leadership style? Oh yeah, in a big way. Um, I, I for the first thirty years of my life, I think I was achievement oriented. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I kind of Show, figure out what muscles I have. Well, I'll go out there and I'll try to do something, right? And I'll kind of figure out what my strengths are. Um, the next 30 years of my life, my daughter, Marnie, she's 14 years old, 14 months old, excuse me. She is going to help me develop uh, a sense of slowing down, uh, not being oriented around achievements, being more oriented around being, being present. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm going to achieve something, it's not going to be for anybody else but my own soul. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's not going to be to make somebody else applaud. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to, it's just bringing a different energy to, mm -hmm. to my life and Marnie brings that energy. She's not, 
She does not care what dad's achieving. She just yeah. wants dad to be present. Yeah. It's you know? a grounding experience. Isn't yes, it? yes. She just wants dad to play. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's what I want. You know, yeah. that's what I want to be doing. So my daughter is came at the perfect time because I don't want to be living this kind of high pitched, stim- overstimulated life anymore. Yeah, which is and, so easy. Oh, the software world is like built for it, yeah. right? Twelve months out of the year, all the dang time, yeah. right? High pitched stimulation, mm-hmm. um, and my body needs rest. Yeah, and I'm 33. And my body uh, needs rest differently than it did when I was yeah. 23, you know? We grew up in a culture where even sleep was a weakness. Amen. Amen. And it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. The fuel in the tank, you know, yeah. it, it, we're calling a weakness. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, that's the fuel in the tank. Yeah. It's um, a fairly I, recent shift. It is. Yeah. I, I've been napping every day for like six years, man. Really? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, and you want to know why? Fuel in my tank. Yeah. I'm a much kinder, more thoughtful person post-nap. So right. is this like a 20-minute power nap at a particular time of the day? What's this look like? Today, it was like a 35-minute, I fall asleep. Um, but some days, I don't fall asleep. Some days, I just body buzz, you know, for 20 minutes. Oh, yeah? It's almost like a level one sleep where, like, I'm, I am in a different place, but mm-hmm. I'm not full asleep, but it still rejuvenates. It's, okay. it's still, it still charges the batteries, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, and I just find it to be that I'm And by the I'm way, cooler. just to make it clear, we're at like 1.30 in the afternoon. So you're already, you're, you're not even to the 2.30 feeling yet. No, no, I, I usually start to feel that around noon. Okay. You know, where I'm like, oh, I'm not my best self anymore. Yeah. And if I really want to have an afternoon that, you know, is, a, is one where I'm getting things done yeah. and I'm not just kind of fussy. Yeah. I'm just a whole different person when I'm tired, you know. And so I don't want to, and that's not the kind of person I want to show up to at yeah. work. Uh, so I handle stress better, all that stuff. Um, that's good. With that self, day self-awareness. Um. Let's go back in time. Yeah. So formation of lesson lead time. So you, Connor, yep. what was the situation? What was the, what was the scenario and what was the driving kind of problem or opportunity that catalyzed the formation of this company? Yeah. So Mike Fitzgerald, Christian Anderson, uh, Dustin Sapp and I had started a company before lesson they called Quipple. Mm-hmm. So these are gentlemen who um, have a lot more experience than me, have a lot less time than me. You know, I'm, I'm, I've got time. They have experience, and we're like, I'm like, hey, can you help? Yep. And I was an intern for Christian um, prior to that, and you know, so I was like, hey, I know you know how to do this. I've seen you build business mm-hmm. with other people. Can you help? So Quipple doesn't work out. We can, we can talk about that. Uh, but a year and nine months, I don't sell a, a deal, and th- and then it's like, I want to do this again. And Christian really encouraged me. He's like, you just learn the hard way, right? Like double down. Yeah. Like you just learn some skills, mm-hmm. right? By don't shy away. Yeah. Lean in. And right. You've just learned something, yeah. right? Yeah. By having it not work. Yeah. Like, to walk away right now might be to not use the, the muscles mm-hmm. you've just built. And that was great advice. And it was also not my mom telling me that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, if my mom tells me that, I, she loves me. Yeah. Um, Which is big of him, too, because he was, you know, probably financially invested in that whole, oh, yeah. kind of, that, that whole period of time as well. Yeah. He knows how it works, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that this is a risk, and this one didn't work out. Maybe the next one will. Mm-hmm. Um, so the next one comes up, Eric Tobias, uh, Dustin Sapp is really busy, a tinderbox so that becomes octave. Eric Tobias comes in and says, you know, training software is something I've never bought. We should look into that space. Um, and Mike Fitzgerald also said, hey, training uh, software is something I'm interested in too. But he was thinking on the business consumer side. Eric's thinking the business to business side. I'm like, I'll look at both. I'll look at both. So I just go explore both um, and find, get really lucky. A venture firm called Union Square Ventures open sources all of its information on the, on the business to consumer training side. And it's like, don't go there. You know, mm. basically like, hey, we're going to have to raise a lot more money than we can raise around here. Yeah. It's going to be a consumer business. It's going to be a big money burner. Yep. It's not my, my DNA to do that. So we go B2B and start building Lessonly. Connor's my roommate at the time. Okay. He goes and tries it at Salesforce without asking. Um, he goes to Australia and uses Lessonly, early, early version of Lessonly to train these Australian sales reps. Um, and it works. And he's uh-huh. like, dude, I can go sell this. You know, like, <laughs> I, I've just done it. You know, I've just used it and it works. Yeah. And uh Everything changed when Connor joined the company, um, and I know we want to talk about some like really important moments in the business. But yeah. like this, the, the the dynamics of the people that I got to surround myself with that were very different than me. Yeah, Connor is my best friend. Uh, him and I are very different. Uh, we do not share a bunch of interests. But that's actually what makes it really special. Um, and he brought like a yin yang yeah to me, and then Corey Kaim comes in, brings another, and it's like almost like this ensemble mm-hmm. where we all have different flashlights on the globe. And I can never, we can never see the whole globe because it's a globe, right? But our flashlights are all different and they're all in different spots and together we can illuminate more of the globe. And the globe is the business, yeah. right? And it's hard yeah. to navigate yeah, yeah, business. Yeah. So the more different flashlights we got on that globe, like yeah. the clearer things are. Yeah. And, and I just really appreciate having uh, all these different people around me who are so fundamentally wired differently than I am. Mm-hmm. Um, that is the difference maker in the business. So let's go there. 
the lessonly journey were a book and you had the chapters that were the real sort of inflection points. And you, and you now look back and you say, okay, there were those moments where the little thing mattered so much, whether yeah. it was a introduction and a connection, whether it was a, whether it was a, a kind of a key hire or just an event that tipped in your direction. What yeah. were some of those inflection points when yeah. you look back on them now? Yeah, getting an internship with Christian, and at, I, I was at Indiana University, mm -hmm. uh, and he gave me an internship. I didn't know him, didn't know anybody in Indianapolis, and I got an internship for design and strategy, and I did not know what strategy was, and I was not a designer. Um, <laughs> I had to look up strategy on Wikipedia. Uh, I was like, uh, what is this? How is this different than, you know, I just didn't know. Um, I was not a business student, you know, I just didn't know a lot. Um, so he lets me in. He tells me I should apply for the OR Fellowship, and that's the big inflection point is being an being a part of the OR Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Because Connor was in the OR Fellowship, Corey oh, yeah. Kyle was in the OR Fellowship, Mitch Causey, these yeah. are the first three people that come full time on the team, mm -hmm. all people I met in the OR Fellowship. Mm -hmm. um, I don't become roommates with Connor without it. it you get the idea, right? Yeah. It's, that's a gigantic change in my life. So build upon that, you and I have both had the good fortune of being part of the OR Fellowship. Yeah. But what brought us both to Indianapolis, brought us to this tech community, was really the entree to, to, to both starting startups and that, yeah. that journey. Yeah. Talk more about outside of those, you know, kind of initial connections. You, you've also had, you know, now it's sort of the, the early relationships like Christian and Mike and Eric, you know, institutionalized as high alpha now. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What has, what has like the high alpha uh, set of relationships meant for the business? Yeah. And then build upon the OR Fellowship story as well. Yeah, for anybody who doesn't know about the OR Fellowship, if you're coming out of college, uh, you can apply for the OR Fellowship and they will help you get placed with a... Um, young uh, or, or a high tech company in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. doesn't have to be a new one, right? But it's a tech company in Indianapolis. Yeah. So less than these 260 people, we don't, still at this point do not have the capacity to go to all the career fairs. So the Art Fellowship goes out to all these career fairs, right? And, and finds people like me who want to join yep. startups, uh, want to join tech companies, but don't really know how to. And then they place them. And right now, I think they're placing like 80 kids a year. You know, when, when I was in it, when you were in it, it was like, I think it was 10 for yeah. you and it was like 20 for me. So yeah. It was, uh, I was really nervous. I wasn't going to get in. And then I got in. And I was like, yes. And I got placed with Chris Baggett. And so Chris Baggett's the guy who starts Exact Target uh, with Scott Dorsey in town. This is like the biggest success story we have, right? Mm -hmm. And he's my first, you know, the first guy I get to learn from out, yeah. out of school. Um, Talk about good fortune. And he looks at me and he says, save your money. You can do whatever you want if you, if you can leave a job, right? Mm -hmm. Like the ability to leave a job and, and have a little money in the bank. Yeah. Uh, it, is, is the lifeline to kind of doing some, what you want. Yeah, you know? yeah. So he's like, save, save, save. And yeah. I had student loans, so I was like, i got to pay these off, and then I'll save, save, save. Yeah. But great advice from Chris. I meet all these people. I'm like one of the luckiest guys in the world mentor-wise. You know, like, I wish everybody had mentors. I see the guidance. I see the gifts it gives me, and it makes, I get sad knowing that so many folks are just hungry for one. Mm -hmm. you know, and I've got like eight. Yeah. You know, and I don't say that with like boasting. It's just like... It's amazing, yeah. you know, and I just wish more people did yeah. um, because they can help me. They've helped me so in so many ways. And Scott Dorsey, as, as you mentioned from High Alpha, mm -hmm. he's one of them. He joins the board, lessonly, I would I say five years ago, mm -hmm. four or five years ago. Um, I was thrilled because mm -hmm. he was like, hey, I'd, I'd be interested in joining the board. I was like, I would love to have you join the board. <laughs> like, wouldn't have even thought to ask, yeah. you know, like, I'm not going to, I don't even think he's going to go there. And he's like, I'd like to join. And I was like, dude, that'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so Connor and I have this person we can call who has not only done it, but done it exceptionally well, mm -hmm. um, and done it in a way that we really relate to, yeah. you know, his style is one we really relate to. He, he likes, culture was core yeah, for exact target yeah. as well, right? Right. And they had their own, and we have our own, mm -hmm. but relationships mattered, right? They were big in relationships, we're big on relationships, you yeah. know, so we really jived. But he also brought this perspective of, hey, you guys, uh, you know, you, you are, can think bigger than you are right now. Mm -hmm. He was very consistently that way. Like, you're onto something, you can think bigger, and you, yeah. you'll get there. So delve into that because you've, you've talked about how the frugality mm -hmm. was critical at the beginning in order to, to, oh, yeah. to allow, your, allow you freedom. Yeah. But then you had to flip the switch at some point. Yeah. How did you do that? Yeah. People like Scott, uh, you know, hires who made like um, uh, uh, Kyle Lacey mm -hmm. uh, and um, Brian Motman, he comes in as our CFO and they help us see that we can think differently about how we spend in the business mm -hmm. and how it can be really wise to think differently. Um, you know, going to like Dreamforce, Salesforce's conference, like the first yeah. time we did that was a big, big expense for us. Yeah, big expense. But, you know, we had encouragement from folks who know what they were doing, of like, give it a try, life will go on, buying Lessonly.com. You know, that was a mm. big ticket item for us. We, we didn't own Lessonly.com when things started. What was uh, the first URL? Uh, Lesson.ly. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So a, a Libyan uh, uh, kind of 
top country code, you know, mm -hmm. um, which has uh, problematic. Yeah, yeah, because you can't talk about uh, a few things on Libyan country codes, and like, and we had some customers who talked about those things. You know, mm -hmm. we were like, oh, we might want to get off of this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, those expenses, um, just, and it wasn't just expenses, just like pushing ourselves. Hey, Max, like Scott's like, hey, Max, you can write a book. Uh, he, like, you know, Kyle, Kyle says you can write a book. Scott says I can write a book. I'm like, well, I can probably go do that. You know, it's just really good to have that encouragement. That and the, the idea of a startup CEO, like allowing his or herself to, to think that it was okay to step away from the business to do something like that. Yeah, I was terrified. You have to be liberated to do it. I was terrified. Yeah, because, you know, everybody's going to be taking on things that I otherwise would have been doing. All the exec team now has more work yeah. as I go focus on this yeah. because I'm not around to that stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm th sitting here thinking I'm burdening people. We don't actually know what this book's going to be about. You know, because it was not clear. I had to write my way to it, you know. Um, so it better work, yep. you know, and it might not. Yep. Uh, and, um, and unfortunately, it, I got an alignment and a vision. Uh, a gentleman named Pete Gall, another mentor of mine, was like, figure out the one person you want to write to and write to them. Uh, and write it like letters. Like, and I had one person in mind who I was like, if I want to pass on some information, here's a person who might really benefit from it. And I just wrote to them. A specific person or a persona of a person? No, a real person. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, Luke, the CEO at NCAMP, uh, mm -hmm. uh, he was my person. I was like, hey, he, asked, he at the time asked me a lot of questions. And I was like, well, I'll just maybe answer him a bunch of them, you know, yeah. <laughs> about how I think work should work. Yeah. Um, and, you know, dear Luke, and then start the chapter, sincerely, Max, but then cut those out at the end, and, you, you know, that's how the book was written. How long did that process take? Uh, like nine months. To write like a hundred pages, yeah, not a very big book, yeah. Um, but but it, it was a, it was tough. I cried, I, I cried many times writing. <laughs> I'm, no, no, no joke. Many times I was like, "What am I doing? This isn't going to work." When I didn't get a lot of sleep, I said, "This is terrible." You know. Mm -hmm. Then I'd get sleep and I'd come back and be like, "Not so bad." Yeah. You know, like yeah, totally different approach. Yeah. Um, let's uh, let's shift to just what you're seeing. You're naturally in a space. You're helping companies. Train and onboard yeah. their their teammates, their employees. Yeah. A lot of times, new teammates and employees. And then we enter COVID, yeah. where in mass companies are going remote, and people mm -hmm. are ha having to hire people in a non physical environment. Right. What is what are you seeing change about employee onboarding and training? Yeah. In this new environment that we're entering into. Yeah, so we work with a lot of contact centers. So one really cool thing that I probably most people are not aware of is a lot of contact, folks who work in contact centers used to have to go into the office. Mm -hmm. And that was a mandate. There was a, maybe a lack of trust there in a lot of cases. Like, you have sure. to be in here to do this. Uh, COVID hits, and all of them have to... Like, we had a, a customer who had 30,000 people in contact centers every day. They had to shift those 30,000 people to be able to work from home. What a gift for a lot of those 30,000 people mm -hmm. who really enjoy working from home, right? Yeah. And never would have had the opportunity. Yeah. And Lessonly is there to make it so that they don't have to be in the training facility to get trained, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a really cool, important part in helping these folks now be, have more flexibility in their lives, right? Mm -hmm. They don't have to drive in every day to, to do that job. Yeah. Um, so basically our business, uh, it was a headwind and a tailwind for us uh, because what we sold is really important in, 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 in COVID world, right? Mm -hmm. Ability to disseminate information to people on the same page no matter where they are, right? Yep. They don't have to be in the same room. A lot of training happens in conference rooms uh, mm -hmm. with PowerPoints, and um, that was no longer a possi possibility, right? So we really could step in and help a lot of companies at that time who were like, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. We could also steward a bunch who were already customers who were shifting from everybody was always in the office to not everybody's in the office. They were like, how do you all do that? Mm -hmm. you know, we've, we've had a hybrid approach, not as hybrid as we are now, but like we've had remote people for a very yeah. long time. Yeah. Um, and we were like, hey, we do it well in some areas and not in others, but it was just a fun place to be. It was certainly, you know, if, if, there, if we're going to, if we're going to have something like happen with COVID, it definitely was a, was not a negative impact to our business. You know, mm -hmm. like I, I felt badly for a lot of businesses who that directly negatively impacted it. For us, it was kind of like, hey, there's new people out there who might buy. Yeah. Also, also unfortunately, a lot of bunch, bunch of businesses went out of business, right? So that was a headwind for us and them. Yeah. You know? So, uh, when you, there are a lot of people that talk about now the challenges of trying to onboard new, particularly early in career, yeah. individuals into a workplace that maybe they've never experienced before, yeah. going into a job that where they don't have the skills yet yeah. to be able to do it. What are your, what's your forecast for um, what the world's going to need to look like in order for these early in career individuals to come in? Can they do it completely in a virtual environment or do you think that it needs a, a, a hybrid or in-person type of setup? 
I, I would really, really encourage any company who's onboarding new teammates to uh, make sure that they get the team together once a quarter in the same place. I don't think there's any, there's any substitute for mm -hmm. sitting in a room with somebody, and being physically present, and seeing the, the office, right? Like, even if you're not going to work in the office, being in the office uh, gives, uh, it's, there's something about it. It's something I cannot put words to, right? But it gives a sense of place, yeah. you know? Um, so I think, you know, the way everybody's doing it with Zoom and, and with Lessonly and all these different tools matters, mm -hmm. but not to forget how important it is to breathe in the same space with somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just we treat one another differently, I think, when we've had that. Yeah. that, that. And then, you know, one thing that I recommend and uh, that we've done now at Seismic uh, that has really helped is just doing the high-low exercise with new teammates, uh, which is just like, tell me about a highlight, tell me about a low light, and, and, do, and going around the room. How frequently are you doing that? Um, I, I don't think that's a frequent exercise. I think that's like, hey, when the team feels like it's kind of fresh and needs a reset, mm -hmm. you know, like let's go, let's go around the room mm -hmm. and really dedicate like hours to mm -hmm. just doing timelines and just learning about folks and what they care about. Because you, you, you're going to get some low lights in there that help, in my experience, help the other person make more sense. Mm -hmm. You know, like, hey, I lost my dad at an early age. We didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I never learned how to open up. And then it's like, well, they might not be as communicative. And I might have noticed that. And that might, not, that might be why, right? Yeah. It's not that this person doesn't want to be communicative. It's that they never learned, right? Yeah. And we can learn those from stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we can be more graceful and, I think, gentle with one another as a result. Uh, speaking of some of those lessons, you ref referenced Quipple as yeah. part of the journey. Yeah. What lessons, when you then dove into Lessonly, uh, what lessons did you take from the Quipple experience that you applied or that you wished you would have done differently? Yeah, so uh, I wrote about uh, in Do Better Work, chapter two is called Share Before You're Ready, and it basically is like what I did wrong with Quipple. It's maybe an alternative title. So what I did with Quipple is I perfected it in a vacuum. I tried to build the software um, without talking to the people who ultimately were going to benefit from it, who I wanted to benefit from it, right? Mm -hmm. I kind of thought I knew what they needed, mm -hmm. you know? bit of hubris in there, a bit of naivety um, of just like, I'm going to build this and I know how to build it. And when, I, uh, when I'm when i done, I'm going to show them and they're going to be pumped. Mm -hmm. What ended up actually happening is I built it uh, with, with Dustin Sapp, with Mike and Christian, and uh, I had 300 people would sign up for early access. So the day that it, it's go live time, I send a note to those 300 people. Within three minutes, I get one response that says, hey, Max, congratulations. Why doesn't Quibble do X? And I can't remember exactly what X was, but it was this really neat idea that I never once thought of in all these nine months of development. And this is three minutes in. This person sees it within three minutes. This was a moment of kind of clarity for me of I do not see all the angles. Mm -hmm. That was an important angle to have that I just missed. Mm -hmm. And there's probably going to be more. And there were many more. You know? yeah. So ultimately, I couldn't sell the product because it wasn't built for anybody but me. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd built it like I thought it needed to be built. And it didn't meet the market's needs. Yeah. So the best lesson I took from it is you know, that's a perfectionist approach. And sharing, sharing before you're ready is a, an anti-perfectionist approach, which is I don't have all the angles. I, I have a general sketch of where I think X or Y or Z project should go, you know, whether it's Quipple or anything else. I'm going to get in front of the people who I ultimately depend on the success of the project and ask them some clarifying questions. What do you like about this? What do you not like about this? What am I missing? You know? mm -hmm. And that requires humility. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires being open to doing something that maybe wasn't my first choice. Mm -hmm. um, but more than anything, it's just about hearing. You know? And so I went, I, with, more, with Lessonly, we went out and heard. And we built slower. And we showed people screenshots and said, this doesn't exist yet. Tell us what, you, tell us what makes sense, yeah. you know? Or was we, I didn't do that with Quibble. So a great lesson of just kind of being slower and not totally being, is. Yeah, not being so uh, sure. Yeah. You built, a, you built a company here in the indie tech scene, in the indie mm -hmm. tech community. Talk about that experience. What, what did that mean to the business? What was it like to build a, build a business here in Indiana? Yeah. What, was, what were some of the, the benefits of that? Yeah, I like that we could take it at, a, at our own speed. There weren't so many other companies around that had set a precedent for how a company in Indianapolis should be ran, mm -hmm. tech-wise. Uh, like we could kind of be like, we, I felt like we could kind of pioneer our own way. Mm. It wasn't that everybody who was coming, joining us was coming from other tech companies and they had all these expectations of what we should have here, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think if you're living out in New York or Silicon Valley, like you, you see a lot of, there's a lot of sameness because people are just trying to keep up, right, mm -hmm. with one another. Oh, they have an in-house chef. We'll get an in-house chef. You know, and like that stuff can really spiral. Yeah. We didn't have a lot of those pressures, so we got to kind of think our own way through things, which I'm sure had pros and cons. Mm -hmm. But we got to kind of set our own pace, um, and we weren't pushed to really. We weren't pushed by any but new hires to do some, something something wild. You know, so I think that was I think that was nice. Yeah. Um, we had a ton of great schools here. You know, and we, we still do right mm -hmm. uh, that we were able to hire talented people from, and. Uh, 
it was really nice to have somebody like Salesforce. You know, they can they can move people here, and mm-hmm. sometimes they move people here, and those people work at Salesforce for five years, and then they the end of five years are like, maybe the sixth year I'll do something different. Mm-hmm. You know, and they might come here. Mm-hmm. Um, so the ecosystem was there. You know, like the ecosystem was definitely there to kind of make this work. But it, we didn't. It wasn't so well established that we, I don't. That our creativity was hampered. You know, yeah. we had to kind of do it our own way. Yeah, I referenced the the Mirror Awards moment where you where Lesson Lee won Startup of the Year. Yeah, and you cited how uh, you were so grateful for so many people that took yeah. time out of their day to say, "How can I help?" Mm-hmm. and to help you. You're now in a position mm-hmm. where you can pay pay it forward. Oh yeah. So how do you plan to do that? Yeah, I hope I already have been. I mean, I get I get a lot of notes from a lot of folks saying, "Can I just can we just spend some time?" Mm-hmm. You know, so my my goal was never to wait till this was done to spend time with folks, yep. and I think that's the best way that I can is just whatever degree of mentorship uh, I can I can offer. It, you know, mentorship I think requires a relationship that is long term. But if I can sit there with somebody and really listen for an hour uh, about what they're going through and yeah. just and, and just share with them what I believe, yeah. not saying it's right or wrong, right? Yeah. Just my perspective. Yeah. Um, I think that is a really important way for me to be helpful. Yeah. And it's also very life-giving to me. Yeah. Uh, whenever I have my last day at Lessonly, I plan to do some teaching. And uh, I'd like to teach um, generally my perspective on life, which has a lot to do with entrepreneurship, but also mm-hmm. just is bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there are some groups in town like Elevate Indie that I'm really interested in, in being a part of mm-hmm. uh, that go into like high schools and help high school students who are hungry to learn um, but might not have access to the folks who can share what they've learned, mm-hmm. that's, that's a big... When I do that right now, when I spend time with those groups, that's like, like 12 out of 10 energy for me. Like Jess mm-hmm. can tell when I walk downstairs that like I am energized, you know? Just um, your wife? Yeah, sorry, yeah. just my wife. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's just evident that that is very life-giving for me. Yeah. So I just plan to keep doing that mm-hmm. and maybe have more time to do it in the future. You know? Yeah, that is awesome. Max, this has been a pleasure. It has, thank you. Congratulations again to you and the team on a, on a successful journey and, and outcome for the business. And uh, we look forward to great things with Lesson Lee and Seismic yeah. um, in the future and, and also with you personally. So thanks, thanks for taking the time. It was my pleasure, man. Thank you.